Good morning. I'm John Jacobs, and I extra excerpted my words to you to introduce the, today's reading from the uh, uh, from the uh, New English Bible, which is not new. It's 52 years old, published in 1970. Uh, the Book of Acts in that Bible are highlighted on the top with a, a lead of every page that says the beginning of the church. And essentially that's what we're talking about, the beginning of the church. For several decades after the death of Jesus, small groups came together and shared the experiences and witnesses. The apostles, led by Peter, a spokesman in difficult situations, addressed many groups of people. The small group grew larger so they, became, they came to the attention of church authorities, especially the high priest. To put a stop to what the budding group was doing, spreading the word of Jesus, he jailed the lead group, planning to bring them to trial the next day. He did just that, though a mystical thing happened during the night. The group was freed from the jail and went to the temple to resume teaching as Jesus has taught. Yet jail doors were still locked and guards on duty in the morning, retrieving those escaping, the escapees in the morning from the temple, the high priest began the trial. Here starts the reading of Acts chapter five, verses 27 to 32. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them saying, we gave you strict orders not to teach his name in his name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring the man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Here ends the morning's reading. Thanks be to God for these words of life. We must obey God rather than any human authority. That's the line that stuck out to me when I read this passage. We must obey God rather than any human authority. It's empowering, right? I don't have to listen to you. I only have to listen to God. It makes me feel, I don't know, like important. But I wonder how many times this has been misused. I mean, I have to believe that this line, whether literally or the sentiment it expresses, has been used to justify all kinds of ungodly stuff. For example, around the time the book of Acts was written, the legal minimum age of marriage for Roman girls was 12. However, the law provided no sanctions for breaking it, so that law was broken without fear of punishment. Our best guess at a common age for marriage for Roman girls is 12 to 15, which is particularly disturbing when we also know that marriages happening before the onset of puberty were regarded by some as deviant, but they were not, and ex they were not exceptional, and in fact, many cases condoned. We've seen cult leaders justify this kind of behavior today because, hey, if it was the age of marriage in the Bible, then we obey God and we don't have to worry about human authorities. This is dangerous ground to trot upon. The tricky thing for me is that, and maybe God speaks directly to you, I don't know, but God doesn't speak directly to me. So when we say we must obey God rather than any human authority, what we really mean is that we must obey our human interpretation 
of what God wants for our world, rather than what we or any other individual or groups might want. And as we know, the Bible requires quite a bit of interpretation, as it was written thousands of years ago in a culture wildly different from our own. How do I tell what God wants, apart from simply what I want, or have been taught, perhaps, to want? Anne Lamott, a fabulous writer, warns us of this. She says, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. Amen, sister. How do I seek the real God, not just the God that's me but all-powerful? Now, volumes and volumes have been written about this question, so for the sake of time, I'll boil down what I believe about God and why I believe that, and you are free to take that or leave it. I believe that God is love, which is not exactly an earth-shattering claim. A lot of people do. The next question, and if we have any three or four-year-olds in the room, maybe they can help us out, is why? Why is God love? Well, here's what makes sense to me. God is the OG, the founder of the universe, the ultimate hipster, if you will, existing before existing was cool or even possible. And God could have chosen to just leave it like that. God is the end-all, be-all, the alpha and the omega. God doesn't really need humans. Or does God? The way I see it, the idea of God as infinite love explains the origin of our existence. God loves so much that God wants to share this love with something other than him, her, their self. And I'm using their in the singular form of it. I'm not a polytheist. Although if we were referring to God in the Trinity, then I guess you could say themselves in the plural, and that would make sense. Anyway, God wants to share this love. And so God creates existence, us, in order to share God's love with us. So in a way, God does need humans, or at least existence, as it wouldn't be in God's nature to not have something with which to share this infinite love. So now we can safely say that when we obey God, we are obeying a being whose primary function, goal, desire, is to love the world, and whose desire is for us to increase the love in the world amongst ourselves through God's work. It's the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with everything you've got, and love your neighbor as yourself. The tricky part, then, is what happens when our love ethic butts up against the human authorities under whom we live and work. Maybe it could be helpful to take a look at some examples of what this might look like today, since preaching about Jesus in public, what the apostles are literally doing in the story, isn't generally considered illegal, at least certainly in our context. A clear example of this was several years ago when it was illegal in several cities to hand out food to homeless folks. I don't know if you guys remember this. Perhaps unsurprisingly, two ministers and a nonagenarian were arrested for doing this, and of course, that was not a good look, and a lawsuit followed. Now, handing out food to folks is protected by the First Amendment, freedom of expression. But for a while there, we had a pretty painfully obvious example of how our Christian convictions can come in conflict with the law of the land. Another example was the members of the Christian group No More Deaths, who were charged after they left food and water in the Arizona desert for folks crossing into the U.S. The human authorities said it would encourage illegal immigration. Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, and whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a, dis of a disciple, tr 
Truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Jesus doesn't mention anything about whether this person is crossing an arbitrary, human-created border or not. It seems like the primary issue here is slaking someone's thirst. And good news for us, those folks were acquitted several years later, as they were able to make the argument that their actions fell under the protection of freedom of religious expression. However, these aren't issues that you and I face every day. These laws didn't even really directly apply to those of us who live around here. There are, of course, laws that might present some issues to us Christians locally. As you may expect, vagrancy laws exist in Hinsdale as well as the surrounding towns. In the Hinsdale Code of Ordinances, under Title V, Police Regulations, Chapter 3, Misdemeanors, Section 15, Vagrants, we read, it shall be unlawful for any mendicant or vagrant to frequent any depot, store, theater, street, alley, sidewalk, park, or other public place, or any place frequented by the public in the village. Now, both mendicant and vagrant are not defined in the law itself. However, Merriam-Webster defines a mendicant as simply a beggar, and a vagrant as one who has no established residence and wanders idly from place to place without lawful or visible means of support. So the ministry of Jesus, organized by people with no established residence, traveling about, meeting in public places without any real gainful means of employment. I believe the ministry of Jesus it's in, a, in its original form would be illegal here, which could result in something like the front cover of the worship order, which is kind of like awkward, right? But as interesting as that is, I don't see myself or any of us undergoing that style of ministry here in Hinsdale anytime soon. So at least for how each of us lives our own lives, it isn't likely that this law will be tested, at least by anyone in this room. Another law that might or perhaps should make Christians uncomfortable is not so much a law as it is a line item. Ways to calculate this vary and there are slight changes from year to year, but generally speaking, about 20% of everyone's income tax payment goes to support the military. Earlier this month, Joe Biden released his annual budget proposal with $813 billion earmarked for national defense. It's the largest defense budget America has ever seen. It's a 4% increase of a budget that already exceeds that of China, India, Russia, the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, Germany, France, Japan, South Korea, Italy, and Australia. That's the next 11 largest national military budgets combined. I can't imagine the Prince of Peace would be fully on board with that. And as a Christian, it makes me uncomfortable that every year I'm actively paying for weapons of all kinds. However, I'm gonna be real with you. I'm not gonna protest defense spending by submitting 80% of what I owe on income taxes. Henry David Thoreau was briefly jailed, albeit illegally, for refusing to pay taxes on account of the government's continued support of slavery. So he had the courage for that kind of civil disobedience. However, Thoreau, I would also like to note, was unmarried. So I'm not saying it was an easy decision. I'm just saying it was probably a lot easier. So if we don't live on the border, and we can legally feed the hungry, and we don't have the guts to mess with our tax returns, then what do we do with this passage? Now, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of ways our faith convictions play out in the political realm that have much more gray area in them than the above examples. 
way to change our existing systems to make sure everybody gets adequate health care, for example, is relevant. How we do that exactly is certainly up for debate. And I'm not a policymaker, so I'm not going to propose any concrete arguments about that. What I do know is that Jesus was pretty big on healing. And I don't think he would really care how it got done as long as the healing actually got done. We said it earlier, Jesus is also pretty big on forgiving debts. So maybe addressing the student loan crisis or debts that result from medical bills would be something that we could get on board with. But before we head into this week, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that on the one hand, there are clear and visible government authorities. But on the other hand, there are also less visible sources of authority all around us vying for our attention and loyalty. There are sort of meta-narratives that float around in our heads that influence what we take seriously, so to speak, How, what we obey or, and what we dismiss. I'll give you some examples. I might get in trouble with some parents for this one. No, you can't get a nose piercing. I can't make everyone happy all the time. But in my understanding of the gospel, God doesn't really care if you have a nose piercing or not. So what underlying human authority is at work there? Another example. It is preferable that my front yard is well manicured, landscaped, and grass, as opposed to serving as a garden from which I can donate the surplus to Hinsdale Community Services. And with the church being in a historic district, I don't even know if we could legally do that on church grounds if we wanted to. There are invisible sources of authority like this in each of our lives, and they are unique and affect each person differently. How much we weigh the importance of formality in our church clothes differs from person to person. Graham killing it this morning. That dude looks sharp. Other people, it's not as big of a deal to them. Also, how much we value whether the clothes we wear to church were made in a way that God would appreciate ethically. Each of us weighs that differently. And there are questions some folks face and others do not. I don't have to make a decision on what kind of bag I bring with me to a social outing. Many of you do. We all obey God's authority in certain ways in our lives, and we all obey human authorities in certain ways as well. I find human authorities on which hairstyles are or are not appropriate mostly irrelevant to the gospel, and that's how you wind up with a minister with a mohawk. Others of you may think otherwise, and you are certainly entitled to that opinion. And if you have a convincing scriptural argument for me where Jesus talks about the importance of hairstyles, I'm happy to hear it. However, if I'm going to be real with y'all, it's only fair if I give you the other side of the coin as well. A quick story, and then we'll head to brunch. A few months ago, a long-time buddy of mine came in and stayed with Anna and me for the weekend. We talked about visiting the city of Leon in Guanajuato, Mexico, a town well-known for its leather industry, boots, shoes, belts. And my buddy, who's known me since we were in preschool, turned to me and he said, well, if there's anything Grant Glowiak loves, it is fine leather goods. And he's not wrong. I mean, I, like, I was offended, but he's not wrong. I have to admit that I do love fine leather goods, which is somewhat ironic, perhaps, for someone who's been a vegetarian for much of their life. My love of nice shoes, though, is most certainly not based in the gospel. It's probably based in a weird blend of narratives around masculinity, taking pride in quality work, and spaghetti westerns. Maybe Indiana Jones and some biker culture thrown in there, too. 
Have I freed myself from the tyrannical hair gods? Yes. Am I still secretly, or perhaps now not so secretly, beholden to the false god of top grain belts and motorcycle jackets? Also yes. I'm not proud of it, but hey, each of us is a work in progress. Maybe one day I'll be able to let that go. My question for you is, what are some of the sources of human authority in your life, both visible and invisible, that are probably okay if you just let them go? Amen. <laughs>